Welcome to the Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Los Alamos. I'm Andrea Dederman, and I'm a worship associate for this congregation. Our minister, the Reverend John Cullinan, has, take, has today off, and I'm delighted to welcome our guest, Reverend Gail Mariner. Albert Schweitzer wrote, we all live spiritually by what others have given us in the significant hours of our life. These significant hours do not announce themselves as coming, but arrive unexpected. Nor do they make a great show of themselves. They pass almost unperceived. Often, Indeed, their significance comes home to us first as we look back, just as the beauty of a piece of music or a landscape often strikes us first in our recollection of it. Much that has become our own in courage, gentleness, kindness, willingness to forgive, in truthfulness, loyalty, resignation under suffering, we owe to people in whom we have seen or experienced these virtues, vir virtues at work. Sometimes in a great matter, sometimes in a small. A thought which had become act sprang into us like a spark and lighted a new flame within us. Okay. Today, and next. We'll have a hymn next. <laughs> um, please rise in body and spirit if you're able.
We can remain standing for our affirmation. As Unitarian Universalists, we affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of every person and a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. Whoever you are, whomever you love, wherever you are at this moment and wherever you are on your life's journey, you, you are welcome here. If you are joining us for the first time, we invite you to talk to any of us after the service and return next week when Reverend John will be back in the pulpit. Everyone is invited to join us in, to join in coffee and conversation in the fellowship hall. Again, welcome to all of you, whether, whether you are watching the live stream or are in, or, or in the sanctuary today. We are glad you're here. You may sit. <clears throat> I'm a little nervous today. I have a lot of things going on, but you will be here to keep me strong. Today, we light a candle for my brother-in-law, Wayne Dederman. Uh, we, we light a candle for my in-laws, uh, Bob and Laura Dederman, going through some things. Today, we light a candle for Michelle Lawberry, my sister. And today, we... We light a candle in memory of my brother-in-law, Nicholas Alberry, who passed away this morning. And we light a candle for my best buddy, Becky Parker, who passed away, and we did a celebration. So let's take a moment and move into a time of quiet and contemplation. I invite you to close your eyes if that feels comfortable for you, to take a deep breath, and as you exhale, to feel your body relax. Breathe. Let your thoughts drift. Breathe and feel your heart soften and open. Let it stretch until it can cradle all of the sorrows and the joys, all the complexity and turmoil, all the joy and confusion that are so much a part of being human in our time. Breathe. And as we rest together in this beautiful, open, safe space, I invite you to feel the connections that you have with one another. Imagine that thread connecting you to each of the members of the, this community and to all of the members who are not here in person today, but who are perhaps watching from home. Breathe and know that you are not alone. Breathe and feel yourself held in the affection and the regard of this community. As we rest together in the quiet now, I would offer you words from Kathleen McTeague, who writes, this is a house of peace. Breathe in a grateful breath that you sit here in this moment of your life safely in this welcoming quiet. 
there is a war raging. Far from this place of comfort, we know that it is there and we know our brothers and sisters suffer its poisonous touch. Our hearts are weighted with what we cannot resolve. And so here, we lift a banner in our own souls and remember that in this place and in this moment, we do not have to be at war. Breathe in the moment of this truth. Here, in this place, in this community, in this faith, is our strength, our deep well of courage. Breathing in, let us rest our spirits. Breathing out, let us pray for peace. May those around the world and close to home who find themselves in harm's way be safe for another day. May those who drive the engines of power be awakened by compassion. May we all hold up the cup filled with courage and will that has been carried by peacemakers for long ages before us. May we, be, may we drink of it deeply and be steadfast in the ways of peace. May it be so. It is so lovely to hear people singing in church again. I can't tell you. <laughs> so, uh, and it is lovely to have young people in the room. I have, let's see, I have two things happening here, and I need to make sure that I weave them together properly. So when I was a little girl, my bedroom was so full of plants, it looked kind of like a jungle. It had spider plants hanging down, and it had vines climbing up the wall, and it had about seven or eight African violets, all of which I started from single leaves from one of my grandmother's African violet plants. The plants in my room, not one of them was bought. They were all what we called pass-along plants back in the day. That meant they were given as slips and cuttings and passed from one neighbor to the next. Now, the cool thing about past long plants is that if your Swedish ivy ends up with spider mites and dies, or if your spider plant ends up getting way overwatered by the house sitter who's been a little overzealous and it kind of turns to mush, 
then the great thing about pass-along plants is you just go talk to the friend who you gave a cutting to, and they'll give a cutting back to you. It's kind of an insurance policy. Now, it occurred to me that pass-along plants are not the only thing that we pass from one person to another person. We also pass our feelings from one person to someone else. And so in this story by David Rice, published by Dawn Publications, this little boy named Brian starts passing an emotion through his community of feeling. And, well, the book's called When Brian Hugged His Mother. And I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'm just going to give you a taste of how this works. So the way it starts is, Brian woke up feeling great, and he ran into the kitchen, and he gave his mother a kiss and a hug, and he said, I love you, Mom. You're the best mom in the whole wide world. How do you think that made his mom feel? Well, she felt loved and appreciated. Now, because she felt loved and appreciated, she was motivated to go the extra mile and make the kids their very favorite breakfast that day, which was waffles with peanut butter and whipped cream. <laughs> Sounds kind of decadent to me. And she said to her kids, I'm so glad you are my family, that you're my children, because you bring me so much happiness. And Brian and his little sister felt loved and cherished. And because Joanna, the little sister, was feeling loved and cherished, she helped her teacher, Mr. Emerson, get ready for school that morning. And she said, I like helping you, Mr. Emerson. You're a really good teacher, and you make le learning fun. And guess how the teacher felt? The teacher felt respected and competent, and he turned around and did something nice for the principal, who turned around and did something nice for the guidance counselor who turned around and did something nice for one of the children, who turned around and did something nice for his little brother, uh, who turned around and did something nice for the bus driver. And this goes on and on throughout the story. Because each person has been passed a sprig of love and respect and affection, they turn around and hand it off to someone else. And right at the end of the story, the police officer who stops Brian's father for going too fast <laughs> doesn't give him a ticket, just gives him a warning. And so the father then is nice to the big brother, who is nice to the little brother, and at the end of the day, Brian once again feels loved and treasured. All that goodness has come back to him. And the pictures are great. So if you're looking for a good bedtime read, that's a good one. Especially if you have little people. So as I was putting the service together for today, it occurred to me, and it's why I chose the Schweitzer reading, that plants and feelings are not the only things that are passed from person to person. In the faith development community, we also often say that religions are, not, are caught, not taught. We catch them, our values, our ideals, from other people out there in the world. Schweitzer says, we, much of what becomes our own in courage, gentleness, kindness, and willingness to forgive, in truthfulness, loyalty, resignation under suffering, we owe to other people in whom we have seen those values at work. Well, in times like the ones we are living in, my friends, those glimpses of honesty and kindness and generosity and wisdom become one of the ways we hold on to our faith in humankind and our faith in one another. And like a sprig of geranium or inch plant, every time we pass on our own values by living them in public, we can be assured that they're going to come back to us in those moments when we need them most. Thank you for listening.
So just so you know, Reverend John isn't actually playing hooky this morning. He's down in Santa Fe in my pulpit preaching to my congregation. The uh, practice of exchanging pulpits is an old one in Unitarian Universalism that goes all the way back to the Cambridge platform in New England, which says congregations are meant to take care of one another and to be accountable to one another. And so uh, it's kind of fun being able to be in someone else's space. I was in your space first, probably very close to exactly 10 years ago, when I came to, San to Los Alamos to pre-candidate for the pulpit down in Santa Fe. And this is the first time I've been able to preach in your new space, which is just lovely. Now, I know that Reverend John has mentioned on more than one occasion, one of them I think last week, that Unitarian Universalism can be a challenging faith if you actually take it seriously. Folks who are part of other faith traditions are invited to give their hearts to powers beyond their ken and to trust that those powers will facilitate desirable outcomes. Now, Unitarian Universalists often give our th hearts to things beyond our direct experience, but what our faith tradition asks us to do is to rest our hearts in some abstract values and virtues like love and like justice, knowing that as we do so, that the only thing that will make those values real in the world is our own hard work and the hard work of other human beings just like us. I want to suggest this morning that hope and kindness and faith in humankind are grassroots, pass-along kinds of values in the world. They move from person to person, one person at a time. And when we come together in community on Sunday mornings, we are intentionally looking at those values that we want to pass along and propagate out there in the world. Like the little boy in the story, what we're trying to figure out is how to make the world a better place by being the kind of person we would like to encounter. Then, when we have a bad day, when the news about Ukraine is overwhelming, when there's a car accident and someone we know is injured, when any of those complicated, difficult, and tragic things that happen in our lives happen, we can turn to one another and rekindle the spark in one another's spirits. Now, as a minister, I am in the very fortunate position of being able to see the kindness, courage, and generosity that the members of my congregation offer to one another and pass along in the world, and I am absolutely confident that the same kinds of qualities pass from person to person in this community as well, in this particular bit of the land of enchantment. And so what I would like to do for the next few minutes is just share with you some of the things that have rekindled my soul in the last few weeks that have given me or supported my faith in humankind 
in the midst of these dark times that we are living in. Yes, we are on, at least temporarily, the waning edge of this pandemic, but things are still pretty worrisome out there. The situation in Ukraine continues to be devastating. And so much of the news coverage makes my heart ache, and I am always tempted to switch the radio channel to something with music instead, but I keep listening. And I'm glad that I do, because there are so many brave and warm-hearted news people who are out there looking for the silver linings in this tragedy and finding stories of courage and creativity and compassion and the generosity of the people of Ukraine helping one another in these difficult times, and the bravery and compassion and generosity of their neighbors in Poland and in Transylvania, in Romania, and in Hungary, all along that border where people are opening up their doors and welcoming refugees and trying to find the resources to support them. I'm also amazed and heartened by the courage of the growing number of Russian people who are appalled at the behavior of their government and who are speaking out despite the very real risks of dissent in a totalitarian regime. Here at home, there has been an amazing outpouring of generosity as people send funds to the UU Service Committee and to our Hungarian Unitarian congregations. I know you have a partner church who is, uh, and I suspect, like many of the other Romanian and Hungarian congregations, they are involved in one form of support or another. I don't track sort of the social justice stuff going on here in Los Alamos quite as closely as I track what's happening down in Santa Fe. But in the last two weeks, there have been at least two gatherings in Santa Fe where people have come together to support peace in Ukraine. One of them sponsored by our Muslim, members of our Muslim community, and another sponsored by members of the Interfaith Leadership Alliance, who have agreed to do this every week um, from now until Easter, take a break for Easter, and then maybe resume. So their gathering is called 30 Minutes of Peace. It's on a Saturday or Sunday afternoon, and it changes. In each of those gatherings, a couple interesting things are happening which give me a little bit more faith in humanity. There is quiet. There is beautiful music. There are prayers from multiple different faith traditions, not just Christian prayers or Unitarian Universalist prayers, but Buddhist and Muslim and um, and there's also an offering which goes to whichever Ukrainian refugee support or peace support organization that the hosting congregation is gathering funds for. So we had our first one last Sunday. Forty people showed up. The word only went out on Friday. It warmed my heart that people would show up on short notice. One of the brightest spots in my world recently, as we move from the most global to slightly more local, has been the matching of your congregation and my congregation with our Afghan refugee family. We've actually been working on this about five years, back before a certain president was elected, Santa Fe was organizing to become a refugee resettlement site for Syrian refugees and had persuaded the government that we were a big enough community to be able to house a fair number of people. And then there was an election and everything was tabled. And so when the opportunity arose last autumn to be able to help Afghan refugees set, be resettled here in our corner of the world. I, absolutely, we, the, 
the folks at the Interfaith Leadership Alliance and the folks in Santa Fe who were interested in refugee resettlement started getting organized, and I was delighted that we could co-sponsor in our congregations that we didn't have to do it one-on-one. -on -one. And so between us, I think we have 19 people who are already vetted and trained and have begun working with our family who will move into their home, I think, on April 1st. Now, as part of that, we promised two different things. We, well, we promised way more than that. The first thing we had to do was raise money, and we've done that. And it has gone to Lutheran Family Services in support of our families. The second thing we promised to do was train people, and we did that too. Now we need to help gather the things that they need to set up their new home. And there are some very specific things that we're being asked for, both in my congregation in Santa Fe and also here. We need twin sheet sets in sort of neutral colors, um, brand new. Sheet sets have to be brand new. We need towels and pillows. Blankets uh, can be blankets that you've had for a while if they're really in good shape. We also need dressers and lamps. And I know you can watch your newsletter and there will be announcements. I am taking a carload of stuff back that your congregation has already de donated very generously, and I will hand it off to the point person in Santa Fe who is helping get it to people's homes, or to the, our family's home. I can't tell you how good it feels. Well, I can tell you. I'm going to tell you how good it feels to actually be able to do something after the long wait that we have had. Patience is one of the virtues we're calling to pass along to one another. And now I think speed and focus as we move into providing our partners the things that they need. Humility, because as John will tell you and as I will tell you and have told my congregation, we like to think we know. That's part of being Unitarian Universalist. And in this case, the families who are arriving here have so much courage and so much resilience and so much gumption. The father of our family has a job already. He doesn't speak English yet, but he has a job. And he has a bicycle. And he is commuting every day to his work and getting his family started again. We have a lot of values that we can glean, a lot of sparks that can be rekindled in us from this family that we are working with. Now, global, more local, more local still. Last week, not the one that just ended, but the one before, I found faith in humankind in a place I really didn't expect. A member of my congregation died two weeks ago. She had been diagnosed with ovarian cancer. I had been walking with her in that for about four years. And I got a phone call on Monday of that week that her cancer had stopped responding to treatment and that she was going to avail herself of the end-of-life options legislation that a couple of other church members and I had advocated for here in New Mexico. And when I went to visit her, I didn't know that that's what she was going to do. She looked like any of you here in the room. She looked well. She was sharp. She knew exactly what she wanted. She had spent the previous week calling her friends all over the country so she could say her goodbyes. And a lot of them said, now wait, you don't do anything until I get there so I can say goodbye in person. Her son was there, her brother was there. We had a wonderful conversation. And then on Wednesday, I got another phone call. And the call, call said, Gail, we don't know how to do this. We know how to grieve when someone has died, when there's been an accident or a tragedy, but we don't know how to navigate this even though we know that her cancer has spread, 
that she can no longer eat and drink. She seems just fine. How do we put our arms around this in a way that will honor this, the power and compassion in her decision? And so we created a really simple ritual for her husband and her son and her brother and her. And on Friday morning at 9 o'clock, I went over, and her women's group went to the labyrinth up by the, on Museum Hill, and they walked the labyrinth for the entire two hours. Even though it didn't take nearly that long, we didn't know when, how things would unfold. I have to tell you, it was one of the most beautiful things I have ever been privileged to witness. She lit her chalice. I said some words. Her family said their goodbyes and how much she had meant to them. She said her final farewells to them and how much she loved each of them. And then part of one of the safeties in this legislation in New Mexico is that you have to be able to self-administer the cocktail, which will eventually stop your breathing. And since she couldn't eat or drink, she had to have a tube. So there was a doctor there who had placed the tube for her, and she pressed the plunger. And it took two or three minutes, and she drifted off to sleep. It was incredibly gentle. And we listened to this beautiful music that she had chosen, and we told stories. Her son and her husband and her brother told stories about all the wonderful parts of her life. Their childhood, their early marriage, the son's childhood, building their house in Santa Fe, um, trips with her women's, all these wonderful stories. And about 20 minutes later, she stopped breathing. Now, before that happened, in that first conversation I had with her on Monday, I had said, what do we need to know? You've gone through this long process and come to terms with us. What do we need to know? What have you learned in this difficult journey that you have been on? And she said, I learned that people are kind. I have encountered more kindness in my journey with cancer than I ever thought was out there. Please tell people that. Please tell them that ovarian cancer is horrible and the research needs to be funded and the people who are going through it or living with it need to be held and cherished the way I was held and cherished. And please tell them about this option because I am so glad that I get to hold on to my dignity and to choose. I am so glad that I don't have to suffer the inevitable suffering that would be part of my path if this option weren't there. What a rare gift. In this time of war and violence, in this time of COVID, when so many people couldn't be together, in this time of civil unrest and police violence, what a gift to be able to die surrounded by your loved ones, for them to be able to comfort one another and hold one another in those moments. Gratitude, courage, compassion, all of these were sparks that leapt from her into me and that I hope will leap from my heart and my story into you. People are kind. People can be kind. When we look around our world, 
for the people whose inner spark kindles and rekindles our own, the ones who live their values day to day to day, the ones who ignite our and inspire our courage and compassion just by their ordinary ways of being, then it becomes steadily easier, I think, to have faith and keep faith in humankind. And so my invitation to you this morning is to live out the values that you have been given by people whom you love and admire. Live out those values that have taken root in your heart and your soul and pass them on to the people you care about most. Because that way, when you are in a difficult time, they will come back to you. To help that process, I invite you to take a sprig of one, out of one of these little vases that I have up front, or take a whole vase if you're called to take many sprigs. And I'm going to tell you what's in them. We have Swedish ivy from my brother's wedding. We have geraniums from the geraniums that have been growing in big pots at UU Santa Fe for the last 10 years. We have inch plant that was given to me as a Mother's Day gift. My twin second grade teacher had them make Mother's Day gifts, and they all rooted little cuttings and put them in pots. And it has survived from then until now. Um, un unnamed monster begonia that gets these huge leaves and hairy stems which belonged to one of my college roommates back in Minnesota, which my brother took a slip from. And when I gave away my plant when I was living in Houston, he gave me another cutting. And now I have cuttings there for you. This is how we do it in Unitarian Universalist congregations, not with plants, but with positive emotions and with values. We look for the ones who inspire us, we learn from them, we borrow a little of the goodness that they have given us, and then we turn around and give it to someone else. So if you grow one of these, if you take one, uh, you can keep it in water for months, even years, but when you finally put it in the dirt and it grows, all I ask is that you pass a cutting of it on to somebody else, and that when you look at it, you remember the ways that we feed one another with our own goodness and struggle and love. And that this is a place you can come to to get reminded of that every single Sunday. May it be so. Today's, <clears throat> today's announcements are on the uh, back of your order of service. Tina, if you have something special you want to bring to our congregation. Um, so this will go out in the April voice, but also I wanted to announce it here. The UU Women's Retreat is back this spring on May 7th. So Saturday, May 7th, we'll have a UU Women's Retreat. Um, and it is based on the book Cassandra Speaks by Elizabeth Lesser um, about women telling their, their stories. Um, and we'll have some writing activities. Renee Mitchell will be helping us and Kelly Dolesi will be helping us. Um, and we'll have some yoga 
and uh, I know our own Kathy Gertzky is out of town that weekend. <laughs> We're sorry. Um, and uh, Christine Koblenz will be helping us with some yoga, and we'll get some pig and fig. And so look for that announcement um, if you want to join our UU Women's Retreat. It's going to be a great time. And then also we have our fourth through sixth grade owls starting up after spring break. Um, so if you have, if you know of fourth through sixth graders, or if you have a fourth through sixth grader, um, we'll be starting that up on April 10th. So those are the RE announcements. Thanks. And now, and now it's time for our offering. Um, this is an opportunity to, to share some of what you have with the wider world. <clears throat> I'll share the plate partner for this month is our partner church in Romania. 100% 100, 100 of all of this offering will be given to them. We are not going to pass, we're not passing a basket this morning, but there is an offering box in the back of the sanctuary by the door for checks and cash. Or you can give, um, you, can, you can use the Givelify, Givelify app, app or Givelify.com. May the offering, muse, may the offertory music lift your spirits and provide a moment to consider what you are able to give. May what you give bring you joy. I'm going to come over here. Our closing words this morning are adapted from the Reverend Kate Braystrup. May love and skill be in our hands. May love and courage fill our hearts. May love and wisdom light our minds. May love flow through us and walk among us as we live our lives and work to heal our world. May it be so.
Be well. Be well.